Hi, everybody. We're going to kind of try to whip through the residential sales contract. We're going to retouch and revisit this a couple of different times. So um, let's go ahead and get started. I already have it pulled up. I'm going to my Forms or Us, and let me minimize this. And we're going to go ahead and just fill this out. Now, the first thing you did already, of course, is you went to uh, the intranet, the URE intranet, unless you've already have them printed out, and got a copy of your sales checklist so you know what to include in your offer and contract. Okay, so here we go. We have, uh, we're going to date the contract today. This is the day that we're entering into the agreement. Of course, it's not fully executed until all parties sign. All right, so we're just going to make up a name, John and Sue Smith. I always like to include for title purposes so they know who they're running title on. What is the status of the people that are going under contract? So John and Sue could be brother and sister. They are, in this case, going to be a married couple. Whoops. Okay, so let's go on down. We're going to purchase a house today in... Um, Let's do the city because it, it's pretty easy to fill it out if it was St. Charles County, blah, 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 blah. So let's go to the city. Okay, and then we're going to put the city here. It'll be St. Louis City. And then we're going to do the full legal address here. One, two, three, Walnut Street. St. Louis, Missouri. It's always better to include the um, entire address. Uh, I think 104 is a zip code down there. Um, so it's just, again, we're always thinking about how the title is going to look at it and run title. Okay. This is kind of important. It says here, not the seller's disclosure, the MLS or other promo promotional material is going to basically tell us what's going to be included in this sale. So to avoid any misunderstandings, um, we're going to list if there's any exceptions to the included or excluded. So let's pretend, we're going to go on down, that the client saw this awesome roll-away table in the kitchen. It just, it just fits this kitchen perfect. And so we're going to include that just to make sure. So we're going to say to include roll away, meaning it's not attached, island in kitchen. So I would even go further than that. And I would probably say a little bit more of a description, um, red island in kitchen as shown at walkthrough, dated 117.17. Okay. All right. So we're going to go down to, well, let's kind of stay on this a little bit. Anything that you think there might be a question about, anything that can be conceived or, you know, that they're going to take with them a rug, a appliance. One thing on appliances, guys, because this has came up in the past, make sure that it if you do an appliance, that you go into detail about the appliance. Is it a Viking refrigerator model number XYZ, whatever? Or is it a, a mana range or is it a whirlpool microwave make sure because i have known in the past that if you just put a stove there the only thing that you're obligating your seller to do or the seller to do is have a stove there so please be as detailed as possible it's better to be safe than sorry okay so when we were walking through this house we saw this horrible shed in the back and it just needed to be knocked down. So we're going to ask them to do that to save your buyer some, some trouble. So uh, excluded shed 
Now this shed is not on a foundation or anything. It's just a shed and rear of home to be removed prior to closing. Now I always put closing, but bear in mind that might be something that you want to make a call. Um, you might want to put prior to walkthrough because a lot of the buyers freak out if they don't see everything 100%, you know, uh, during the walkthrough. Now, bear in mind, you really don't want to wait. Well, I want to say that you do not want to wait that day of closing to do the walkthrough. Okay, I'm just going to be throwing some different things out there as it comes up. Okay, so we're going to say this house cost, oh, we're offering $250,000. Okay. I usually ask because I want to buy in. If if you've got somebody who's saying they want to purchase a $250,000 home and they want to put $250, $500, I wouldn't take anything less on this sales price or on this purchase price um, than $1,000. You want to buy in. Hi. And then if you have your preferred um, title company, that was Angie, by the way. <laughs> um, if you want to have your preferred title company here, be it um, title partners, be it investors, whoever you, you want to use or your buyer, your buyer wants to use, whoever you have a good rapport with and, and also uh, gives you the best pricing and customer service. Now, we all know that we do not hold earnest money that the earnest money check copy needs to be accompanied with your contract delivered to the title company within 10 days and also the check earnest money check received from your buyer needs to match what you're putting on your sales contract okay so we're going to line this out i love to see lines depends upon the auditor the mrc um, loves to see lines through those as well. Now, additional earnest money to be delivered to escrow agent within blank days after the acceptance deadline. This could be uh, this could be applicable in a couple of different situations. If you're in a multi-offer situation, if you're in a short sell situation. Um, bottom line is, is additional earnest money going to help? the position of your buyer in contract negotiations. So that's what you need to think about, okay? In this particular case, this is just a straight up easy deal. So we're gonna put in A there. But you know, if somebody has, a, if I'm a listing agent and I've got five or six offers and um, you know, maybe I need a little bit more confidence from this particular buyer, I will ask for additional earnest money. And I'm not going to be able to go into every single scenario on these contracts because every deal is going to be different. And so we can talk about those as they come up. Okay. This particular deal is going to be contingent upon financing. Now, hopefully you've emphasized and you've done a great uh, buyer consultation, how important it is to get a pre-approval prior to even to go out and seeing properties. Now. I'm not talking about pre-qualification, which means that you basically, your buyer basically just ran their credit and nothing has been uh, confirmed by the lender. You need a pre-approval. The best one is a pre-approval with only the stipulation of an appraisal and insurance because naturally, of course, well, in title, because naturally you can't do those things until you pick out a house. OK, now just another side note, you can ask for being a listing agent again. You can ask to see with all parties agreeing to that. You can see the buyer stipulation page, meaning if you're in a multiple offer situation again, you have every right to ask on behalf of your seller. By the way, I want to see the buyer's pre-approval letter with the stipulation page, meaning has that lender verified employment? 
Have they verified income? Have they seen pay stub? Are they, you know, have they seen their tax returns? So you guys be aggressive with this. Now, if you have a buyer's agent fight on that, I might kind of think about taking one of the other offers. You need to convince that agent that you need to work together as a team and they need to understand that you're trying to present the best situation for your seller, for that buyer to, you know, get their offer accepted. Okay, so we're going down to the contingency on pond financing. I like to see a date there, usually two to three weeks prior to closing. I have seen agents leave this blank, and so therefore it's 30 days after the acceptance deadline. You can do either or. I personally prefer to see a date. So we're going to close this six weeks out. I'm going to make out. I'm going to make up a date, um, not to switch screens here and there. So we're going to close this. We wrote a January 17th. So let's just say we're going to we're going to go to February, February 15th. And don't check me on the dates on this because I don't know if that's a Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I'm just putting the dates in. So. Always set up your buyer to understand that usually, with exceptions, that a, a transaction will take four to six weeks to close. Cash buyers are a little bit different. Depends upon how far along they are in their financing approval. And also, use this as a negotiation tool. Again, as a listing agent, I look at these dates because then I know how serious and committed the buyer has been because those dates, you know, if you can have a 30 day closing, you've got a pretty serious buyer that has been pretty organized and has their ducks in a row. Okay. So we have a loan amount here. Um, it's 250000 So this could be FHA. Um, very unlikely. It's in the city. So we're not going to be able to do a USDA. And of course, you know, that's income specific. A lot of people that make sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars may not always can buy a two hundred fifty thousand dollar home. It'll be income to debt ratio. So we're going to go a typical. Uh, we're going to do a typical conventional loan here, and so our loan amount is going to be a ninety ten. So that's meaning ninety percent LTV. So they're going to be borrow borrowing ninety percent of the loan amount and putting ten percent down. Okay, so I leave this blank or put my lines through. Now, this one initial rate, interest rate not to exceed. This could be a sticky situation. I'd always ask my lender for guidance on this one. Um, you could put prevailing rate, especially you can feel pretty safe with that if it's an FHA, um, VA, or even USDA. Conventional might be a little bit different, so let's just say you want to give a little bit of uh, a little bit of room here. The rates have been staying pretty strong around threes and fours, and depending upon their program, their credit score is what their rate's going to be. So I would look at my letter and my lender, which I'm sure you've talked to by now at least once, and ask them what they suggest. Let's pretend like the rates right now are about four. You're going to ask your borrower what would happen if the rates all of a sudden shot up to four and a half, five, five and a half percent. So take this serious. So let's just say your buyer can't go over a four and a half percent interest rate because their income to debt ratios will get all the whack. You need to make note of that because that's a way out for them. So if the rates go up to five and a half, and you put four and a half here, this contract's dead. Okay? So let's put 30 years. Again, you got to work together as a team. Everybody be open about what the goals are. Okay, so other terms. In this particular deal, we're not going to have any other terms. There are some situations that you will fill this out that we might talk about on some different contracts. Hard money, USDA, that kind of a thing. Also, this is a good place for me to bring this up. If there's any chance that your buyer may not have the 10% down and may consider going FHA, matter of fact, we're going to do that on this one. This is where you're going to check those boxes. The best, the best way to do this is in the beginning, 
setting up the listing agent and the seller that there could be a probab probability of that might happening, might happen, okay? So we're gonna go conventional and we're gonna go FHA. Hey, we can even mark, if they're a veteran, we can even go VA. It's all gonna come down to closing costs, payment, what is gonna be their best deal and the best situation for them at that particular time, okay? So we never, ever, never, ever, never want to close the last Friday of the month. So again, I'm not going to look up these particular dates for this example. So we're going to, we're going to pretend like this is a Wednesday or a Thursday in February. And we're going to, and it's going to be the 27th. Always try to close on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday because if something goes wrong on that Friday and it's the last day of the month, you're not going to be able to address those problems till Monday. Worst case scenario is this. You did your walkthrough the same day of closing. Your closing day is Friday. Your closing day is the last Friday of the month. You're asking for problems. Do not do that. Try to close as early as possible. So if there are any hiccups, you can handle them then. And also remember, all everything gets wired at 2 p.m. or before. Okay, and that's how these deals get funded. Unless your lender brings a check, a check to the title company. So again, that's another conversation that you need to have. So we're going to... Well, I'm just going to put uh, preferred in here again. Remember, you're going to you're going to pick whoever you want who you have a great relationship with. Okay, so we're going to go on down. And you know, the best situation is if here if you're going to close at the same title company as your seller. So sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't, and um, it only becomes a problem when you don't have the same underwriter. Talk to your title representative how they want to best handle that, and um, maybe they can give some little bit better guidance. I have no idea who the, everybody's underwriters are, so it's again best to communicate that with your with your team of people that's going to help you do this transaction. Okay, so seller, but a no. Sorry about that. Keys to buyer no later than. Believe it or not, this is very, very important. Now, what this means, and hopefully the listing agent sets up the seller appropriately, because I've had this happen time and again, when it says these at 5 p.m. in here, that means that seller has vacated and has turned over possession of that property at 5 p.m. Now, you could have had this deal funded at 1.30 but that seller does not have to surrender those keys until no later than 5 p.m., okay? Make sure these conversations are made. My personal last, my last deal was a renter was in the home and he was purchasing and building another new home and for some reason, he just didn't think that he had to vacate. We did not get keys and ended up being a nightmare until 9 p.m. that night. That cannot happen. That could have turned into a really bad situation. So, you know, do your best. Make sure that this is included in your buyer consultation and in your listing consultation, that they're crystal clear on the legalities of how this process is supposed to come down. Okay. Now, you know, on a conventional loan, you have to do the appraisal rider protecting your buyer, meaning that if this home does not appraise, there's a couple of choices that need to be, well, actually three. Your seller needs to either reduce the price. Your buyer either has to come to the table with cash or three, they can be released from the obligation of the contract. Okay, now if you have an FHA, loan, which we're going to include this anyway, because remember we said we might go FHA, but with an FHA loan, of course, you do not have to include an appraisal writer. 
FHA um, appraisals work a little bit differently, which we're going to talk about that in its in, a, in in its own entirety. Too much to go through here. Okay, so you know, look at your other writers. Um, is this a backup contract? Has it just been disclosed? It, does your buyer have a a uh, property to sell and close? Is that property on the market? As a listing agent, I would ask ask that. I would want to see the MLS print out, see how aggressively it's priced. Is it just needing to close? You know, ask all these questions. So again, that you know, um, really setting up a situation that you're going to put out as many fires up front as possible. Okay. Title and survey. Um, I know during CE time, I really recommended you guys to take a survey class. You would not believe what can happen with surveys. And you think out here in St. Charles County that uh, the builders took care of this or it's, everything's new. Please, please, please try to convince your buyers to do the surveys. Also, there's some great information on Forms or Us. I, if it was me, I would probably include that in my buyer presentation consultation and have them initial that they've read it and they've understand the risk of not doing a survey. Do not bother doing a spot survey. Um, a lot of title companies won't ensure the boundaries on those and go ahead and do a boundary survey. But again, you have a great pamphlet that's available to you online on Forms or Us. Okay. Um, again, you got to have clear title and you've got to have a hopefully no uh, easements or, you know, anything going on with the boundaries there. OK, mostly here with the exceptions of a lot of bank owned buyer always orders and provides, uh, you know, title and that kind of a thing. It's so funny if you just go up to Kansas City, they do it totally different. All right. 25 days if none stated. Now, you guys, bear in mind, you've got your building inspection dates, which you don't want to want to order anything until you know that you're going to at least agree on your building inspection. God forbid you order your appraisal until your building inspection is, is completed. Now, think about those dates when you do your closing date because you, you really want to make sure that flows. You want to do your building inspection first. Once you clear the building inspection, everything goes in, in hyperspeed. You're going to make sure you get any insurance you know quotes taken care of, which we'll go through in that paragraph. You want to make sure everything is sent off to title with, your, with an appropriate cover sheet. So nothing is done until you get through that building inspection. Do not, unless there's an exception, I, I ask mine to get done anywhere from five to 10 days. That, because that's time off market. And that's time that your buyer is wasting um, where they could have found maybe something else that was in better condition. Push through those building inspections as quickly as possible. Okay, we're gonna pass all that. We always have a lot of questions with people, what they pay at closing. I would kind of go through this portion here. So they kind of expect, uh, kind of know what's up as far as closing costs. I would even go further and maybe do a little worksheet for them. And hope, hopefully their uh, lender has went through it with them as well. Okay, here we go. Inspection disclaimers and warranties. Um, you know, with me, this is something I've always been mostly a listing agent, but with me, I've always countered these. When I have somebody wanting to take 15 days to do an inspection, that means it's 15 days downtime for my sellers. So I will always counter that. You guys can, you know, counter those inspection dates as well. So for, for lack of, of, well, for this particular situation, we'll go ahead and we'll just put, I want seven. We want to hurry up and make sure this house is right for us. So we want to knock it out. I mean, I've even seen five, especially again, if I'm in a multiple offer situation, a good listing agent, which, which offer would you take? Somebody who wants to do the inspection in five days or an offer that, that uh, somebody wants to take 15 days. Um, I hope you said five. So anyway, same here. I want to get this knocked out. I want a quick closing date. Also on these closing dates, guys, let's go back up here real quick. 
You can always do, um, oops, or sooner. Again, that's showing your set the seller that you've got it together, and that if that's a, if um, if that's a motivation for him, then um, you can negotiate that. You you've got it together. Your buyer is ready to go. That if he needed to be out of that home in thirty days, then um, then your then your buyer can do that. Again, you're making your your case for your buyer. That's the best way to put it. You're making a case for your buyer so the seller will accept this offer. Okay, so let's go on down. Talked about that. Inspections, kind of a pet peeve of mine. Um, I always set up my sellers to always expect a buyer to ask for a home warranty. Now, let me give you a different philosophy. If your buyer's coming in really low, ten to fifteen thousand, and they're asking for a home warranty, on the south side, on the list side, I would say to that buyer, I'd go ahead and give him a home warranty. But on that building inspection, I would make a note, which you can in a counter, and say, um, Mr. or Mrs. Buyer, I will allow you to. I'll discount this ten thousand dollars. Just just say I'll buy a home warranty. But um, when it comes to time for the building inspection, we're only going to address safety issues, code issues, and structural issues. I mean, I had a buyer one time that we went through and we were looking at a property and the carpet needs stretched. So we negotiated two or three thousand dollars for new carpeting, whatever the case might be. But then he wanted to come back in on a building inspection and ask that seller to stretch it. I said, no, we've already got the discount up front. So bear that in mind. We want it to be a win-win situation. You, you don't want to rape your seller enough that he can't even come to the closing table. And the numbers just doesn't make sense. So, you know, bear look at all sides of the picture. Okay, so we're going to purchase this. The seller, we're going to ask for the seller to purchase this. Be very detailed here. We're going to purchase um, a HWA. Warranty, and I don't know the pricing on this exactly, to include, oh, let's just say this has a pool. Not to exceed, which I don't even know if this is possible, but we're going to do it. Five hundred and fifty dollars. Always put a num. Always put a number in there. Not to exceed because you want one your seller to know what he is going to have to discount off of his his net, and two, you you want to make sure that you get the most bang for your your buck. So you want to make sure you put an amount in there. Okay. Any any questions about any of this? Just give me a call. A lot of things that I get very concerned about is um, agents wait to the last minute to get the quote for the insurance. One, your lender is going to need that for the um, mortgage. I can't think of the word of it. The mortgagee clause, and also you need it for payment. You know, you need to know. If for payments are going to fi fall into the guideline, again, another communication with your lender. And also, too, there has been situations um, that a seller will make a claim on a roof and not put the roof on the house and pocket the money, and it's not going to close. That is in a huge database that your insurance representative will run just to make sure that things like that are not happening. That insurance money stays with the house. It's not to the homeowner. So make sure you send off to get a quote from your insurance person as soon as possible. These deals do fall apart over that. Okay, government inspection and occupancy inspection. The best thing I could tell you on this is check your municipality. City is different. Um, 
Ferguson's going to be different than Wentzville. So wherever you purchase on Maris, on one of the links, it'll give you um, some information on what everybody requires. Okay. Some people have occupancy requirements. Um, a funny story, and I don't know if it's like this now, but back in the day, two of the same sex could not live within a certain square footage in Clayton. They wouldn't, they wouldn't allow it. So these are kind of important things that you guys want to investigate, especially if you have a buyer agency agreement. Transaction brokerage is a little bit different. So if you are a buyer's agent, it is your job to find out as much information as possible. Now, again, you guys, um, a couple of these things, you're not want to put yourself in the position of an expert. You're going to direct them to the appropriate website and let them kind to kind of make their own decisions on the information that they're reading personally, especially with schools. I would most definitely do that. Okay. Um, let's touch this uh, lawn irrigation system backflow certification. That is something that is included in your inspection. So make sure you do that within the given time. We talked about owner's money, 10 days. That's real estate 101. Okay, loss, that very seldom happens. But of course, if you're under contract, the house burns down, contract's null and void, and all the insurance proceeds go to the seller. Assignability of contract, you may do that with permission. You have to disclose to the listing agent. Let's just say uh, you have a young buyer. Uh, they go in with, you know, 100% commitment, but something happens with their, cre their credit. They want their parents to be assigned a contract. Okay, so if, um, if that's something that happens, that's something we'll talk about on an individual uh, basis. Time is of the essence, always. Okay. People, they need to understand, buyers and sellers, this is a legal document and that you really need 100% commitment. One of my favorite sayings I learned at the beginning of my career that I do not want to carry anybody to the closing table. We have to work together as a team. Okay, so access final walkthrough and utilities. Please try to do this as soon as um, I would try to do 48 to 72 hours. Make sure your buyers know that if the furniture more than likely is not going to be out, but uh, if you want to make it, you know, 48 hours, if you don't see boxes being packed, I would call the listing agent immediately because <laughs> that might be a, a red flag. So try to get through there as soon as possible. If you want to walk through again the day of, I'd just be really careful. The only time I would do the day of is if there was a major rainstorm um, or something like that to make sure the basement didn't leak or, you know, um, they supposed to leave something, but I would try to get in there as soon as possible. Okay. And in the contract, of course, it says four days prior. Um, I would try to do, yeah, three days, two days at the latest. Okay. Special agreements. One thing I keep on hearing a lot of, this particular couple is going to ask for closing costs and prepaids. Um, seller to pay up to, if I was, you'll see this a lot, up to is different than a flat amount. So I don't do up to when I'm representing a buyer. I do a flat amount. Buy, seller to pay $3,500. Again, you're going to talk to your lender. And closing cost and prepaid. So what that means is um, that that lender can spend $3,500 any way that he wants to. He's going to use every single dime. If you do up to... That means whatever that lender does not use in the behalf of your buyer goes back to the seller. So you're going to put that. 
okay? Another thing, and also too, I like to negotiate with hard numbers. So, so far, we know exactly what we're paying, asking the seller to pay in um, a home warranty. We know exactly what we're asking the seller to pay in um, closing costs and prepaids. Okay, another thing that I'm suggesting all, all everyone do is have home broom swept and clear of all debris. Okay, so you can even ask them to change the keys. I wouldn't do that. I would want to do that myself. But we have broom broom swept means there's nothing on the floors that it's 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 clean. Okay, so um, a last couple of stories I've heard is people leaving mattresses, people leaving trash bags. This is in the contract, and you can even say word it however you want. But it's in the contract that they cannot do that. So if they do do that, then they're in breach. So you have to make a call to the listing agent. But if they see that and they're acknowledging and accepting that, so that's, you know, 75% of the battle, most likely it's not going to happen then. Okay. Um, seller's disclosure statement. You know, you guys, uh, sellers do not have to fill out seller's disclosures. It's only to their best knowledge. Sometimes it's really good to have those uh, prior to making an offer. So if there was a leak in the last 12 months or actually on the other end of it, if they've done some pretty cool upgrades, you know, provided additional insulation, you know, that's all going to maybe uh, affect the offer. So buyer confirms um, that before signing this offer to purchase that they read through the seller disclosure. Sometimes you don't have a cooperative seller because you know we are not allowed to fill these out ourselves, that you'll have it one day before the acceptance deadline. Kind of a warning on that one. If they are to disclose every, you know, disclose anything more than likely, especially in the seller's market, you've already negotiated this deal. So it's just, you know, you can review it. You can do different things. But I would really emphasize um, trying to get that seller disclosure signed prior. Or if you're buying an as-is property or the person never occupied the home so they have no personal knowledge, you're going to mark the one no seller's disclosure or statement will be provided. Okay? Now, don't let your buyer get all freaked out about it. Um, the sellers are not engineers. The sellers are not contractors. The sellers are not foundation people. You're still going to have a reputable inspector look at it anyway, and the negotiations start all over again. So this is nothing to be alarmed about. And what I suggest you guys, especially your newer agents, I would go maybe to a couple of uh, walkthroughs, or I used to love to go through with my building inspectors. But, you know, I used to buy a lot of unoccupied investment properties, but it was always a good opportunity to learn a lot about different things. You know, cracks off the corner of a basement window. You know, a lot of people see one crack in a foundation and they think the, the world is coming to an end. So what I suggest, you guys, if you can, pick your inspector's brains. Um, take a foundation class, you know, the more confidence that you can instill without presenting yourself as an ex expert. Um, but if you react to, again, a crack off, off of a windowsill and a foundation, which we all know is only because at the corner of those windows is encased in steel, steel does not move. So you're going to have hairline cracks. You know, you, your body language is going <laughs> to freak out a buyer. So I would suggest very strongly um, if you know a rehabber, if you know a foundation person, you know, pick their brains, you know, be the best you can be with this stuff. Okay, licensee assisting seller, you'll see that on your MLS printout. So we're going to say they were a designated agent. We do um, designated agency here as well. Transaction broker, if you'd like to, if you do not have a buyer agency agreement, remember those buyer agency agreements supposed to be on paperless pipeline. They're just like a listing agreement, but you're with the buyer. Okay, seller 
buyer is a real estate licensee acting as a principal party in the contract. Um, of course, you'll note that um, sources of compensation is more likely going to be seller. I've seen them both marked. If you know a seller is only paying two percent, and you've got a buyer agency saying that you want three percent, well, that one percent is going to come from the buyer. Okay. Um, then we're going to United Select Properties. Our, our broker uh, firm is our license, is our office ID, which I've got mine right next to me, which is 2015 Okay. Signature, your license ID, and then date and your MLS ID. Um, I ha actually have had a couple of situations doing some short sales and some odd things that uh, the MLS ID wasn't from a reputable agent. So do pay attention. If you start getting a weird feeling about any of the agents that you're working on this, on um, you know, in these transactions with, I always run everybody. I always want to know who I'm dealing with. So I always check everybody out on Maris. Um, if you can't find them on Maris, that says something else that you might want to give me a call on. Um, or I check him out on uh, the Missouri Real Estate Commission. It does happen. I've had a gal who was representing um, herself on one of our listings. She was buying it in her own LLC through a property management company with one ID. And then she had another ID. I mean, it was crazy. So you don't want to tie up your set, you know, you don't want to tie up your property or a seller's property with situations that definitely can go into something else, something legal. Okay, so offer to be accepted by, let's just say you signed all this. Let's just say now the longer time that you give here, let's just pretend like this is a really hot property and it's a seller's market. You've already told your buyer that. So the longer time that you give your seller to respond is the longest, a longer time that they can get other offers. So this is what I do. I call the listing agent. Listing agent, I'm about ready to send over an offer. Would your seller be okay if I only give a four-hour response time? Call, make sure they know you're sending a time-sensitive document over. Make sure. Call them first. If they do not respond, you call them again. You text them. If they do not respond, you call me, I'll call their broker, or you call their broker directly. Okay, this is a big deal. So let's go ahead and say, oh, the listing agent is more than happy because they already, the seller already knows what they want to net. So yeah, we're more than happy. So we gave them the contract at 4. We want them at 8 p.m response time and we want the same day right because we're making things happen we're the driver of the bus we don't have time to mess around and plus you've already set it up so she's already going to call her seller and probably get a verbal or something and know whatever whatever um, she can do now hear this if you're in a multiple offer situation and you call that listing agent and she tells you she's in you're in a multiple offer situation you have every right to ask that listing agent with the seller's permission can you tell me what number i need to beat my buyers need to beat she's going to say because most of them don't know they they can do that She's going to say, well, I can't do that. I've had this actually from a REMAX agent because it's not fair to the other buyers. Well, first of all, Miss Listing Agent, who are you representing? You're representing the seller. Second of all, if she disclosed it to you with permission of the seller, with permission of your seller, you can say anything that listing agent can say anything and disclose anything the seller says it's okay to. But once she discloses it to you, 
any other buyer that asks her that same question or if she just wants to disclose it, she can. So don't ever forget that. And if she has an issue with that, tell her to talk to her broker or his broker. Okay. So we've got this. Now, um, we've asked for the offer to be accepted. All this. Everybody's good. They either accept, they either reject, and they go into counter. Now, um, this bottom line here is very important. Unless authorized agreed in writing, acceptance de deadline is defined as the date for acceptance, which was provided to the last party whose signature resulted in a contract, even if that signature was obtained before the deadline. So that deadline date of acceptance is what you're going to gear all your inspections off of. Okay. So that's very, very important with building inspections. Um, you know, again, so if you give too much time here, it's going to give you more time in a building inspection, even though they can accept the offer immediately. But just bear that in mind. That's when it gets kind of tricky and a little bit confusing for everybody. So we're going to pretend they're happy. You made a great offer. The house was listed at 252. The seller's good. Everybody's everybody's good to go. Now, one last thing that I want to emphasize as part of the negotiations, we're going to go back up here. Remember when we said seller to pay thirty five hundred in closing costs, and we asked for I think five forty five in a warranty. Buyers and sellers, for that fact, don't understand how that's going to work. So, if you got a property listed at two fifty two, let's just say your your buyer came in at 250 and their brain, they're thinking, wait a minute, I offer 250. So sit with the pen and paper and actually write that out for them. You're going to take 250,000 minus 3,500 minus 545. And given if you have a longer closing time, let's just say you don't want a 60 to a 90 day closing time. You're going to put another payment in for that seller because your buyer can't close within 30 to 45 days. More than likely, your seller is going to have to pay another additional payment. So write that all out. So I'm not going to do the math real quick. Was it 250 minus 3,500 minus 545? You'll get the net number. That's the offer. You need to drive that home to your buyer that Mr. and Mrs. Buyer you're not offering 250. You've asked for closing costs and a home warranty. You're the net offer, the net offer to that seller is this amount. Big big deal. Write it out so they can process it because this is a very confusing, very overwhelming process. I would take my time, send it in an email so they're crystal clear. Okay. So that's it today for the First uh, sales contract, I know there's a lot more that we can cover, but this kind of gives you some basic understanding. And again, if you have any questions, this will be uploaded on YouTube for review. And if you have any questions, you can either put it on the Facebook page once I announce that this is up on YouTube and we can go that way or you can email me directly. And, and you know, as usual, you guys always call me for any questions that you may have during the uh negotiation process. Okay. All right. You guys have a great evening. Appreciate it. Thanks.